Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 2, The King's Road. Yeah, this is a new video series we're trying here at New Rockstars, requested by the viewers, after breaking down Season 6 and 7 with you guys, to go back and rewatch from the beginning, pointing out interesting details and connections in episodes that you might have missed the first time around. And you guys seem to like my breakdown of the pilot episode, so let's just keep moving forward with Episode 2. Quick reminder, this is the episode Arya and Joffrey fight as they head south on the King's Road, resulting in Ned having to kill Sansa's direwolf lady, as well as Bran's assassination attempt and awakening from his coma, and Daenerys learning to seduce Khal Drogo her way. Whew, yeah, this show used to cram a lot of plot into one episode. And sex. By the way, this episode also gives us maybe the most satisfying moment of the season. <laughs> Of course, it's hard to enjoy this moment for too long because the Hound follows it with this ominous, telltale-worthy line. The prince will remember that, little lord. Of course, Joffrey will pay back Tyrion for this tenfold over the coming seasons. Okay, I realize that some of you may be watching these videos while you're watching the series for the first time without knowing future events. By the way, welcome to the world out from under your rock. But if you want to keep fresh eyes and skip any foreshadowing that I do, you can skip to this time. All right, good, they're gone. For the rest of you seasoned watchers on the wall, let's dive deep into the subtle moments that connect to, echo, or foreshadow future events in our segment In Hindsight. Sight. This scene with the Lannisters discussing Bran's health over breakfast has a few interesting exchanges. Well, even if the boy lives, it'd be a cripple, a grotesque. Give me a good, clean death any day. Speaking for the grotesques, I'd have to disagree. Death is so final, whereas life, ah, life is full of possibilities. On one level, Tyrion is defending his own existence to his brother. He was born, to use Jamie's words here, a grotesque cripple. But he prefers that life to no life at all. But also, yeah, this is a hugely ironic thing for Jamie to say, given his future as a grotesque cripple. But in many ways, losing his hand will begin his character's journey, opening his life to be full of possibility. And then the scene ends this way. My dear brother, there are times you make me wonder whose side you're on. My dear brother, you wound me. You know how much I love my family. In hindsight, this exchange foreshadows both Jaime and Tyrion's future conflict on opposite sides of the war between Cersei and Danny in Season 7, but also Tyrion's defense to Catelyn in the book that he couldn't possibly have won Littlefinger's dagger from him in a bet against his brother during the tourney because, quote, I never bet against my family. This episode again foreshadows Jaime's amputation when he bids Jon adieu. Notice the camera gives us this tight close-up of his hand, the same hand that gets chopped off. Jaime also says this to Jon, I'm grateful. It's about good, strong men like you protecting us. Now, Jamie's being sarcastic here, but season seven later will show him genuinely expressing gratitude for Jon's struggles protecting the realm and heading north to join him in that struggle. Okay, let's move on to this goodbye scene between Arya and Jon. Now, to date, this is the only scene in the series of Game of Thrones with these two characters together. So isn't it interesting that we're all so desperate for a reunion between them? Now, of course, Arya and Jon are both stark outsiders who become key protagonists in the series, but I think it really comes down to Jon giving her needle in this moment. One character giving another a sword is usually a defining character moment. And notice John's line here. First lesson, sticking with the pointy end. These words actually come back next episode when Ned decides to let Arya train with Needle. Sticking with the pointy end. The pointy end is actually the title of episode 8 this season. So last video I pointed out how interesting it was that Game of Thrones already started laying the seeds of the mystery of Jon's true mother, Lyanna Stark. This episode goes even deeper into it. First, there are these final words between Ned and Jon. And you are a Stark. You might not have my name, but you have my blood. Is my mother alive? Does she know about me, where I am, where I'm going? Does she care? The next time we see each other, we'll talk about your mother. Notice the pain that actor Sean Bean conveys here. Apparently the actor was told the actual truth that Ned was hiding. The tragic reality that John's mother is Ned's sister, Lyanna, who died in his arms. Benioff and Weiss actually said that George R. R. Martin gave them the rights to adapt the books into an HBO series only after they answered the question, who is Jon Snow's mother? So assuming they got that answer right, it's possible that they passed this secret subtext along to Sean Bean, which is why he's able to play these scenes so suspiciously. Also another little connection here. I like how later in season six, a character named after Ned's sister, Lyanna Mormont, echoes Ned's words here. We know no king, but the king in the north whose name is Stark. I don't care if he's a bastard. 
Ned Stark's blood runs through his veins. Now, in the following scene, Sean Bean again does a remarkable job showing Ned Stark's secret when discussing this lie with Robert. Yours was, uh, Alina? No, you, you told me once. Uh, Meryl? Your bastard's mother. Wyla. That's it. Must have been a rare wench to make Lord Eddard Stark forget his honor. He never told me what she looked like. No, will I? And then, a little after this, notice Ned's reaction when Robert rants about the Targaryens. What her father did to your family, that was unspeakable. What Rhaegar Targaryen did to your sister, the woman I loved. I'll kill every Targaryen I get my hands on. Ned knows that Rhaegar and his sister actually loved each other. And the Targaryen Ned is most concerned about protecting from Robert is actually Rhaegar and Lyanna's child, Aegon Targaryen, Jon. Now later, there's this interesting scene between Jon and Tyrion. My father was the hand of the king for 20 years. Until your brother killed that king? Yes, until my brother killed him. Life is full of these little ironies. Tyrion is right to point out the irony here. Jon's judgment of Jaime for breaking his vows as a knight to protect the king will later look pretty hypocritical when Jon tries to break his vows to abandon the Night's Watch. All right, moving on. Of course, the Valyrian steel cat's paw dagger used in Bran's attempted murder in hindsight becomes a major piece of evidence in later episodes and in the recent season as kind of a smoking gun that Bran uses to convict Littlefinger. And then notice the sexplanation. I'm sorry. The Dothraki handmaid gives Daenerys here. No, Khaleesi. You must look in his eyes always. Love comes in at the eyes. Yeah, Danny will remember this Cosmo sex tip when she makes love with John later. Notice how in the season seven finale, she never breaks eye contact with her nephew. Yeah, you should feel gross about it. And later, during the debate between Ned, Robert, and Cersei over what to do about the kids, there was an interesting little moment when Sansa is called in as a witness. Where's your other daughter, Ned? In bed asleep. Do you know? Sansa. Come here, darling. Ned looks totally caught off guard here. Cersei has already begun to manipulate his eldest daughter behind his back. Now, this manipulation is confirmed by Cersei's satisfied smile when the Stark girls turn on each other. She's in, and the Starks are beginning to unravel. And all of this is setting up when Cersei will exploit Sansa during Ned's conviction later this season, and in the fealty letter she makes Sansa send Rob. By the way, that letter also comes back to haunt Sansa in season seven, becoming a source of conflict between her and Arya. And notice how Arya reacts here. Liar! Yeah, this is essentially a more childish version of the game of faces Arya recently put Sansa through. And then when Ned declares that he, not Illyn Payne, the royal executioner, will put down Sansa's dire wolf lady, he snaps this line at Cersei. If it must be done, I'll do it myself. Is this some trick? The wolf is of the north. She deserves better than a butcher. And the camera cuts to Joffrey, foreshadowing how Ned will end the season on this kid's butcher's block. Ned insisting on executing the dire wolf himself is a callback to his philosophy on justice that he explained to Bran last episode. The man who passes the sentence should swing the sword. In this case, the sentence was technically passed by Robert, the king, but since the king left the room, that job has fallen to the hand of the king, Ned. Now, Ned believes that he should carry out the king's justice, not the executioner, because that's the way it's done in the north. And on an emotional level, he probably feels like he passed the sentence. He was the one responsible for bringing his daughters and their wolves into this whole situation. Now, I'll talk about this ending later, but first, I want to go through and point out all the other ways this episode paralleled past moments in our segment. <laughs> Callbacks! Okay, so when Cersei he talks with Catelyn at Bran's bedside, she talks about how Robert punched the walls when their firstborn died. All the things men do to show you how much they care. Now, Cersei is referring to her husband, Robert, but she's using the words of the brother she's cheating on Robert with. The things I do for love. And later in the scene, Cersei tells Cat that she never visited that baby's body in the crypts. Now, this is kind of a callback to her annoyance that Robert visited Lyanna's grave in the crypts of Winterfell last episode. Again, we're seeing how Cersei is not a character who's reverent or superstitious when it comes to mortality. Once people die, she doesn't pay her respects. She just moves on. Then, before Summer saves Bran from the assassin, Catelyn initially wanted wanted Rob to silence all the howling dire wolves. She wanted them gone. But then she becomes grateful and allowed Summer to stay on Bran's bed. And if you think about it, this is parallel to Catelyn's attitude for Jon this episode. Earlier, when he sat at Bran's bedside to tell him goodbye, she said this. I want you to leave. 
Catelyn wanted to throw out John like a dog, but now her gratitude to Summer begins to make up for this coldness to John. Her heart for these outside dogs is beginning to warm. There's actually something interesting about the shot that I want to come back to later. But I want to talk more about this scene between Cersei and Catelyn. It's, for me, one of the most interesting moments this episode. For one, it was Lena Headey's audition scene that got her the part of Cersei. But also, this scene was purely a creation for the show. This conversation doesn't happen in the book, A Game of Thrones. Let's actually go through all the ways this episode altered things from the source material in our segment. Well, in the books. Okay, yeah, so in this scene, Cersei reveals to Catelyn that she and Robert had a son with dark hair who died from fever shortly after birth. And Cersei isn't lying to Catelyn here. Later in episode five, a private conversation with her and Robert confirms this. Well, in the books, this isn't the case at all. Cersei does reveal later that she conceived a child with Robert, but she aborted it out of spite for him. I know, yikes. The only children in the books that Cersei brought to term were Joffrey Marcel and Tom and Jamie's kids. Now, I think the show changes because, starting in book four of Peace for Crows, we actually begin to get chapters from Cersei's point of view, which really help us empathize with Cersei as a character and see her as less of a true villain and more as this more morally complex character. Now, on the show, meanwhile, we can't read Cersei's thoughts. So in order to keep Cersei as a character we love to hate and not as a character who we hate and hate to watch, they need to keep us on the hook with these sympathetic moments. There are also a few smaller changes, like in the books, Catelyn actually tell Summer the words thank you for saving Bran, and the events at the end of the crossroads actually take place at Castle Derry, where Renly Baratheon and Barristan Selmy actually arrive with Ellen Payne rather than waiting for Robert and Ned down in King's Landing in episode 3. Also, the book gives us more historical context for the river Arya and Joffrey fight next to. This is right around Ruby Ford at the Trident, the place where Robert crushed Rhaegar Targaryen in battle. Robert's warhammer famously smashed the rubies out of Rhaegar's breastplate and scattered them into the water. Arya and the Butcher's Boy are actually trying to to find these rubies. And since Arya humiliated Joffrey at the same location his father humiliated Rhaegar, it makes even more sense why Robert would be so pissed at him. You let that little girl disarm you. Now, there's one more big change from the books, but before I get to it, I wanted to give a special thanks to our sponsor, Skillshare, who helped us make this video. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 17,000 classes on pretty much anything, like Adobe Premiere and After Effects, which we used to make these videos. As a writer myself who's into analyzing the story and characters of Game of Thrones, I love storytelling fundamentals, character conflict, context, and crafts taught by Daniel Jose Older. The first 300 people to click on the promo link in the description will receive a two-month free trial to Skillshare and all of its resources. It's as low as $10 a month after that to continue learning if you enjoy it, or cancel it if you don't, there's no risk. There's even a mobile app on Android and iPhone that allows you to tap into classes when you're offline. Just check out skl.sh slash new or click on the link in the description to get started. Okay, the final big adaptation from the book is this closing shot, when Bran wakes up from his coma. Well, in the books, we experience Bran's coma through his own two eyes, or in this case, three eyes, as he hears the voice of the three-eyed crow. Yes, in the books, it's crow, not three-eyed raven. Bran soars high over Westeros, looking down on his father and sisters near the trident, and seeing beyond the wall and what he sees makes him cry. He knows officially that winter is coming. So when he wakes up, a name for his dire wolf finally comes to him. As he says, his name is Summer. The show held off on these trippy visions, probably assuming that episode 2 was a little too early to throw the fantastical three-eyed raven elements to the viewers, instead giving us a simpler dream sequence later in the season. Now let's move on to some of the more notable music choices this episode in our segment. Hear that? This episode features the first known instance of Ramin Jawadi's House Stark theme, which ironically plays during a scene with two characters who currently feel the least in common with the Stark family, Jon and Arya. These first two episodes definitely make it seem like Ned and Catelyn are going to be the show's stark protagonists. But this music cue hints that these two characters are actually going to be carrying the torch for the family in the long run of the series. The House Stark theme comes back two more key moments this episode. First, when Jon says goodbye to Bran. And later, when Catelyn says goodbye to her son. Now, notice this arts and crafts thingy that Catelyn sweetly made for Bran out of garbage. If you look closely, zoom in and enhance it on this, there are seven figures in this god's eye, a seven-pointed star composed of the seven new gods. Actually, throughout the episode, you can see Catelyn gradually assembling the pieces of this. Let's dive in and examine some of the other missable visual details in this episode in our segment. Zoom in and enhance. Okay, so early in the episode, when Tyrion delivers the news to his siblings that Bran might pull through, notice this subtle look he gives them checking in on their reactions. Maester says the boy may live. 
Despite being hung over and having just woken up in a dog kennel, Tyrion still has enough wits about him to one, know that Bran's accident was probably caused by his incestuous siblings, and two, slyly gauge their poker faces. Then, with Daenerys' episode, notice how both times she has sex with Khal Drogo, her eyeline clings to her three dragon eggs. She's literally keeping her eyes on the prize. In fact, the only reason Danny initially talks to the handmaid who teaches her these sexy tips is because that one was babbling on about dragons hatching out of a moon egg. And Danny was just like, mm, tell me more about them dragons and that moon egg. So really this struggle to take control of her sexual relationship with Drogo is framed as a step toward her end goal this season, to become the mother of dragons. Okay, next, coming back to the shot that I mentioned before, notice the framing when Catelyn coldly tells Jon to leave. Her husband, Ned, is cleverly positioned in the background between them, so that Catelyn is almost directing this rage at Ned. This is, after all, what Catelyn's anger is all about. She's actually mad at Ned for bringing this bastard into the family. But since she really can't take out that anger on her noble lord husband, Jon becomes the scapegoat. Speaking of scapegoats, let's move on to the deeper meaning this episode. So this episode is titled The King's Road, and actually, writer on the show Brian Cogman initially suggested Robert's line, a dire wolf is no pet, as the episode's title, but Benioff hated the title so much that he told him that if he ever died prematurely, to never name any Game of Thrones episode, a dire wolf is no pet. In either case, this episode's deeper meaning hinges on the heartbreaking execution of Lady Sansa's direwolf. And let's not forget the butcher's boy who was cruelly run down by the hound. These characters are archetypal scapegoats. Now, scapegoats are innocents who suffer for the crimes and sins of others. In literature, history, and pop culture, scapegoats take on unfair punishment so that a corrupt society can process an injustice and move on, but in doing so, proves itself to be even more unjust. And we can look at the title, The King's Road, as kind of a play on words. What does it cost these characters to take the King's Road to enter the high-stake world of rulers. For Ned Stark, choosing the path to join the King in this political game has already left him with blood on his hands. He has brought pain to his wife, their daughters, their direwolves, and himself by taking the King's Road. And as we'll find over and over throughout the series, Lady and the Butcher's Boy won't be the only victims of this decision. Thousands of innocents will be sentenced to death to pay for the petty squabbles of these highborn lords and ladies. Because on Game of Thrones, when you take the king's road, the little guy pays the toll. Did this altered scene with Cersei change the way you see her character? And who would you say is the most at fault for Lady's death? Cersei, Joffrey, Ned, Sansa, Arya, Robert, or Nymeria? Yeah, way to throw your fellow direwolf under the bus. Comment down below and tweet me your thoughts directly at EA Voss or follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. And yeah, keep those thoughts coming on these classic episode rewatch videos in general. Like, this is still an experimental thing. We're busy covering lots of stuff on this channel. Channel, so we'll get to these when we can, but it'll really depend on what you guys want to see. And you can help us want to make more of these videos by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to New Rockstars for more Game of Thrones content as we wait for this long night to end and season eight to start. You can also help this channel be more flexible in general by contributing to us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our current donors, especially Kenny Smith. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.